detached. It couldn't hallucinate. It couldn't do anything at all. Furthermore, even blind people had described veridical perception during out of body experience at the time of their NDE. Scientific study of NDE pushes us to the limits of our medical and neurophysiological ideas about the range of human consciousness and the mind-brain relation. Before I discuss in greater detail some neurophysiological aspects of normal brain function <coughs> and during cardiac arrest, I would like to reconsider certain elements of the NDE. Uh, first, the out-of-body experience. In this experience, people have veridical perception from a position outside and above their lifeless body. And ears have the feeling that they have apparently taken off their body like an old coat. And to their surprise, they appear to have retained their own identity with the possibility of perception, emotions, and a very clear consciousness. This out of body experience is scientifically important because doctors, nurses, and relatives can verify the reported perceptions. They can also corroborate the precise moment the NDE with OBE occurred during the period of CPR. In a recent review of 93 corroborated reports of potentially verifiable out-of-body perceptions during NDE, it was found that about 90% were completely accurate. 8% contained some minor error and only 2% was complete erroneous. This proves that an OBE cannot be an hallucination because this means experience and perception that has no basis in reality, like in psychosis. Neither it can be a delusion, which is an incorrect assessment of a correct perception, nor is it an illusion, which means a misapprehensive or misleading image. Should an OBE be considered as a kind of extrasensory perception? This is clearly shown in this drawing of a six-year-old girl who nearly drowned and was resuscitated in the hospital. And in this drawing, you see a happy and smiling girl watching her resuscitation from above. And this is the report of a nurse of a coronary care unit. During night shift, an ambulance brings in a 44-year-old cyanotic comatose man into the coronary care unit. He was found in a coma about 30 minutes before in the meadow. When we go to intubate the patient, he turns out to have dentures in his mouth. I remove these upper dentures and put them onto the crash cart. Only after about an hour and a half, the patient has sufficient heart rhythm and blood pressure, but he is still ventilated and intubated, and he is still comatose. He is transferred to the intensive care unit to continue the necessary artificial respiration for one week. And after more than a week in coma, do I meet again with the patient who is by now back on the cardiac ward. The moment he sees me, he said, Oh yes, you know where my dentures are. <laughs> I am very, very surprised. Then the patient elucidates. Yes, you were there when I was brought into hospital. And you took my dentures out of my mouth and put them onto that cart. It had all those bottles on it, and there was a sliding drawer underneath, and there you put my teeth. I was especially amazed, because I remember this happening while the man was in deep coma, and in the process of CPR. It appeared that the man had seen himself lying in bed, that he had perceived from above how nurses and doctors had been busy with the CPR. He was also able to describe correctly and into detail the small room in which he had been resuscitated, as well as the appearances of those present, like myself. Then the holographic life review. During this life review, the subject feels the presence and renewed experience of not only every act, but also every thought from one's past life. And one realizes that all of this it is an energy field that, which influences oneself as well as others. All that had been done 
and thought seems to be significant and stored. Because while it's connected with the memories, emotions and consciousness of another person, you experience the consequences of your own thoughts, words and actions to that other person at the very moment in the past that they occurred. Interconnectedness. They understand now the cosmic law that everything one does to others will ultimately be returned to oneself. Patients survey their whole life in one glance. Time and space do not seem to exist during such an experience. Instantaneously they are, they are where they concentrate upon, non-locality. And they can talk for hours about the content of the life review even though the resuscitation only took minutes. Quotation. All of my life up till the present seemed to be placed before me in a kind of panoramic three-dimensional review and each event seemed to be accompanied by consciousness of good or evil or with an insight into cause and effect. Not only did I perceive everything from my own viewpoint but I also knew the thoughts of everyone involved in the event as if I had their thoughts within me. This meant that I perceived not only what I had done or thought, but even in what way it had influenced others, as if I saw things with all-seeing eyes. And so even your thoughts are apparently not wiped out. Consider the impact of this statement for a moment. Your thoughts are never, never wiped out. And all the time during the review, the importance of love was emphasized. Looking back, I cannot say how long this life review and life insight lasted. It may have been long, for every subject came up, but at the same time, it seemed just a fraction of a second, because I perceived it all at the same moment. Time and distance seemed not to exist. I was in all places at the same time and sometimes my attention was drawn to something and then I would be present there. And also a preview or flash forward can be experienced in which both future images from personal life events as well as more general images from the future occur. And again it seems as if time and space do not exist during this preview. And if deceased acquaintances of relatives are encountered in an otherworldly dimension, they are usually recognized by their appearance, and communication is possible through thought transfer. Thus it is also possible to come into contact with the consciousness of diseased persons, interconnectedness. Quotation. During my cardiac arrest I had an extensive experience, and later I saw, apart from a diseased grandmother, a man who had looked at me lovingly, but whom I did not know. More than ten years later, at my daughter, mother's deathbed, she confessed to me that I had been born out of an extramarital relationship, my father being a Jewish man who had been deported and killed during the Second World War. And my mother showed me his picture. The unknown man that I had seen more than ten years before during my knee turned out to be my biological father. Some patients can describe how they returned into their body, mostly through the top of the head, after they had become, had come to understand that it wasn't their time yet, or that they still had to task, a task to fulfill. The conscious return into the body's experience is something very oppressive. They regain consciousness in their body and realize that they are locked up in their damaged body, meaning again all the pain and restriction of their disease. About all people who have experienced an NE lose their fear of death. Quotation. It is outside my domain to discuss something that can only be proven by death. For me, however, this blessing experience was decisive in convincing me that consciousness lives on beyond the grave. And I know now for sure that body and mind are separated. Death was not death, but another form of life.
So we have to come to the surprising conclusion that in our study during cardiac arrest and the evils experienced during a transient functional loss of all functions of the cortex and of the brainstem with the flatline EEG. And because of the occasional and verifiable out-of-body experiences, we know that the NDE with all the reported elements must happen during the period of unconsciousness and not in the first or last seconds of cardiac arrest. But how is it possible that a clear consciousness can be experienced outside one's body at the moment that the brain no longer functions? And how do we know that the EEG is flat in those patients with cardiac arrest? And how can we study this? So many studies with induced cardiac arrest in both human and animal models, cerebral function has been shown to be severely compromised during cardiac arrest with complete cessation of cerebral flow, causing sudden loss of consciousness and of all body reflexes, but also of the, the, the abolition of brainstem activity with the loss of the gag reflex and the corneal reflex, and fixed and dilated pupils are clinical findings in those patients. And also the function of the respiratory center, located close to the brainstem, fails, resulting in apnea, no breathing. And the electrical activity in the cerebral cortex, but also in the deeper structures of the brain in animals, has been shown to be absent after 10 to 20 seconds, a flatline EEG. And an acute myocardial infarction, the duration of cardiac arrest in the coronary care unit is usually 60 to 120 seconds, and in an out of hospital, the rest even takes much, much longer. So, all 562 patients, survivors of cardiac arrest in the four prospective studies must have had a flatline EEG. This conclusion is often called impossible and unscientific. The quite often proposed objection that the flatline EEG does not rule out any brain activity because it is mainly a registration of the electrical activity of the cerebral cortex misses the mark. The issue is not whether there is any brain activity of any kind whatsoever, but whether there is brain activity of the specific form regarded by contemporary neuroscience as a necessary condition of conscious experience with the visible activities in many neural centers. And it has been proven that there is no such specific brain activity at all during cardiac arrest. <coughs> a flatline EEG is also one of the major <coughs> diagnostic tools for the diagnosis of brain death, which is critical for the decision about the possibility of organ donation. And in those cases, the objection about not ruling out any brain activity whatsoever is never mentioned. The quest to find consciousness. For decades, <coughs> extensive research has been done to localize consciousness and memories inside the brain. <coughs> so far, without success. Also, we should ask ourselves how a non-material activity, such as concentrated attention or thinking, can correspond to an observable material reaction in the form of measurable electrical, magnetic and chemical activity in a certain place of the brain or in the form of visible local changes in blood flow in the brain by an fMRI. Neuroimaging studies have shown these aforesaid changes of activities with, with specific areas of the brain becoming active in response to a thought or feeling. However, Although providing evidence for the role of neuronal networks as an intermediary for the manifestation of thoughts, neural correlations, those studies do not imply that those cells also produce the thoughts. A correlation does not elucidate anything about cause or result. Both is possible. A neural activity can be the result of consciousness. Here, consciousness causes brain activity. Or the neural activity can be the cause of experience ex consciousness. In this option, consciousness is the product of brain function. But how should unconscious matter, like our brain, produce consciousness, while the brain only is composed of atoms and molecules and cells with a lot of chemical and electrical processes? 